precious one thank you for tuning in we we are back finally by the grace of god um we had some technical problems and uh, we even thought of postponing the whole broadcast but by the grace of god we are back we are transmitting to you live from um jefferson road in edmonton alberta uh, graciously today i have again with me uh pastor king george obey um i have been saying that anytime he joins me it's a sacrifice here because he has a lot on his hands but he makes that precious time that quality time to be uh with me in studio because you know what this whole thing is is a heartbeat of ours we love to do this to come your way and to share with you especially on the theme we are looking at dealing with the power of pain and man of god thank you so much for making time um thank you Mr. Papa. Thank, thank you so me. much my, my my senior brother now um we wanted to come your way um through skype with uh dr efa unfortunately due to the technical hitch uh, that couldn't be possible but he has he has been able to come our way or to come to us from another channel and so he's going to speak to us on the topic we've all been looking forward to and that is the mystery of pain graciously again man of god last night he he promised to stay on this broadcast and so it's not just going to be today after today and uh, subsequent programs he'll be speaking to us together so far with bishop maxwell hagan from the philippines and um, we thank god for such privileges um this is a man that is so endowed with gates and uh, and so we will be receiving a lot from him apart from um the the teachings you'll be receiving on pain there'll be times that we have thought through you'll be coming to uh, teach us as pastors and church leaders on on issues that will help us to be able to do ministry and do ministry well um for me this is this is a big opportunity it's a big opportunity it's a big privilege god is giving to us to have him do this kind of thing to us. Dr. Efa um, is married, has two children, um, um, has had ministry work done in the Philippines, in the Cameroon teaching, and in Mambila, in, in Nigeria. He taught in a seminary uh, school there and also preached and uh, reached some unraged Muslim community in Nigeria for eight good years. He teaches intercultural study, studies and then he's, he, he also teaches pastoral care. Now, um, we, we're going to have him soon speak to us. I want you to stick and stay and be blessed. Uh, with the teachings he has for us on um, this broadcast. God bless you. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to share with you on this day on a topic about the mystery of pain. As we look upon our world, we see so much pain and suffering. And so this is a timely topic for us to address. When a loved one is near death, We'll do everything and drop everything to be near their bedside to spend those precious last moments with them. We'll lean closely to hear the words they have to say. And when they speak their last words, their final words, we will hang on to those words and treasure them. John chapter 16 relates Jesus' farewell address to his disciples in the upper room. It was the night before his arrest and betrayal and death and these disciples had become dear friends to Jesus over the past few years sharing life together 
They had given up everything to follow him. Some of them had given up profitable careers and comfortable lifestyles. They had put their lives in danger by following Jesus. And things were about to become even more intense now. And Jesus says to them in John 16, 33, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Come on, Jesus. Couldn't you have promised them a sweeter deal? After all that they gave up for you, couldn't you have offered them the promise of a life free from pain and sickness, success in their business ventures? A nice, comfortable, long life full of peace and joy. James and John had been hoping for cabinet minister positions in your new order. Why did you have to promise them trouble? And how do we balance this prophecy with a promise like John 15, 7, just one chapter earlier. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. Or how do we reconcile 2 Timothy 3, 12, which says, indeed, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted with the authority that Jesus gave his disciples over all sickness and demonic powers. And what seems to be a blanket promise in James chapter 5, that the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. We know that these apostles went on to preach the good news of the kingdom in faraway lands and performed many miracles in Jesus' name. Some of them died a martyr's death. Bartholomew was beheaded in what today is known as Armenia. Matthew was killed by the order of the king of Ethiopia, even while he was celebrating the Lord's Supper at the altar. Thomas died a martyr's death in India. Andrew was crucified in Greece. Peter was crucified in Rome. And John lived his last years in exile on the island of Patmos. Indeed, Jesus' words to them, in this world you will have trouble certainly were fulfilled in the lives of his closest friends. Christians have many different approaches when it comes to suffering. Is it something to be eliminated, an illusion, a weakness of the mind, something that we can overcome by simply changing our attitudes or having a change in mindset? This is the, the teaching of that pseudo-Christian cult, the uh, Christian science that sees all sickness and death as an illusion? Or is it a reality to be confronted and accepted? Is suffering always opposed to God's will? Should our prayers always assume that God wants to remove all suffering? Or should we see suffering as part of the providence of God in order to refine and shape our character? And yet to attribute all suffering to God's will is also to, to distort God into a twisted puppeteer, making us go through suffering for no apparent reason. And how can we justify God in the midst of suffering, especially the unspeakable suffering of innocence, the suffering of children? We all seek some kind of explanation in order to inject meaning into senseless suffering, to create some sense of justice or even to defend God. Here are some common biblical explanations of suffering. One, as a punishment for sin. Isaiah 3, 10 to 11 says, tell the righteous it will be well with them for they will enjoy the fruit of their deeds. Woe to the wicked, Disaster is upon them. They will be paid back for what their hands have done. So a, a sort of retributive kind of justice in Isaiah 3. And that's found throughout the Bible. Or suffering can be seen as pedagogical. God is trying to teach us something. He is disciplining us. 
Proverbs 3, 11 to 12, also echoed in Hebrews 12, 11. My child, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves the one he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Tragedy or suffering can be seen as a test, as part of our character or spiritual development. The Shunammite woman who grew in faith through her experiences of tragedy, or the widow of Zarephath, who learned to trust in God during a severe famine. Suffering can be seen as something redemptive, as like a tapestry that is woven and God sees it from the other side, a finished product, a work of art. Romans 5, 3 to 4 says, and not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And then some might, might say that suffering enables us to offer an evangelistic witness. That is to say, we can share our faith, our hope, and our confidence in God in the midst of our suffering, maybe from the hospital bed, as we bear witness to God's presence with us. And I, I have seen this done effectively in that time of great suffering. Now, all of these have some measure of truth, but none is sufficient to encompass every situation. Different contexts require different understandings. And there are two primary approaches to suffering in the Bible. The first one is a moralistic approach, the idea that our actions have consequences. You see this particularly developed in the book of Deuteronomy. If you obey God, you follow his commandments, you put away all other idols, you will enjoy a long life, free from illness, your crops will prosper, and you will be, be blessed with many children. Oh, but if you turn away from God and follow after the evil ways of the surrounding nations, you will reap consequences like illnesses, crop failures, infertility, and maybe even be taken away from the land. This way of thinking about suffering is often heard in the sermons of prosperity preachers today. They tell their flocks that if they give themselves fully to God, dedicate their whole life and their heart to God's ways, and give generously to the church, they can expect many blessings, wealth, good jobs, nice looking children, perfect health, and a shiny new automobile on the driveway. On the other hand, when faithful, loving Christians receive a fatal cancer diagnosis at an early age, or lose their job and have to declare bankruptcy, or a couple is married for 10 years and unable to conceive, they are left with the haunting guilt that maybe they did something wrong. Maybe they did something that displeased God and they are reaping the consequences of their actions. Now, certainly there are cases where our actions produce negative consequences. The result of our sin. When we drink too much alcohol and have an accident while driving intoxicated. When we live off of junk food and refuse to exercise and give ourselves a heart attack, or someone contracts syphilis by visiting a prostitute, infects his wife, and a child is born blind. We do sometimes sow what we reap. But most of the time, we cannot make sense of what is happening to us. And that brings us to a second biblical motif or approach to pain and suffering. That is the approach of the absurdity and mystery. Most times, there seems to be no correlation between our behavior and our suffering. Life is unfair. Sometimes the wicked prosper and seem to have no troubles in life, while the righteous struggle and face trouble after trouble. This is the theme of the wisdom literature. 
It is the primary topic of the book of Job. Job's so-called friends insist that his misfortune must be due to some evil that he has committed, some hidden sin that he has failed to confess. Yet throughout the book, Job protests and claims to be innocent. Ecclesiastes also describes this absurdity. It opens up by saying, Meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. The wise and the fool, the righteous and the wicked all have the same fate. Many of the Psalms are songs of lament, asking God, why is this happening to me? Where are you? Why do you not seem to care? And why have you forgotten your promises? And why do the wicked prosper? Of these two approaches to pain and suffering, which one informed Jesus' worldview? I would say it was the perspective of the wisdom literature. He saw the broken, the bent over, the blind, leprous, the lame, and demon-possessed people as helpless victims struggling to get by in a world that is unfair and that stigmatizes those who are not perfect. He does not suggest that their situation is due to a lack of faith on their part or that their suffering is because of disobedience to God. He looks upon them with compassion as harassed and helpless sheep and offers them a rescue and a new beginning Sometimes the disciples were operating by a moralistic perspective. When they encountered a man who had been born blind in John chapter 9, they asked Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents? And Jesus challenged their wrong assumptions. He did not accept the validity of the question. No one sinned. No one is to blame here. He went on to say that God causes the sun to rise on the just and the unjust, and the rain to fall upon the just and the unjust. On another occasion in Luke chapter 13, a crowd had gathered and some people brought him some news about some Galileans who were massacred, who were killed on Pilate's orders while offering their sacrifices at the altar. And Jesus answered, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? Bad stuff happens. Pain and suffering are a natural part of the human experience, and Christians do not receive an exemption. Not only should we expect persecution and opposition because of our faith and our loyalty to the radical values of the kingdom of God, we also suffer many afflictions that are common to our shared humanity. Cancers, debilitating accidents, stillborn children, mental illness, flus and viruses strike believers just as much as non-believers. Some Christians claim that sickness is never part of the divine plan, that in every situation healing should come. They believe that God's will for us is that we be physically whole, not only in the glorious future kingdom, but already in this life. The Chinese devotional writer Watchman Ni, nee, who wrote during the 20th century, drew this perspective from Isaiah's declaration concerning, concerning the, the suffering servant. From Isaiah 53, verse 4 to 5, that talks about by his wounds or by his stripes, we are healed. Watchman Ni nee declared that Christ bore not only our sins, but our sicknesses on the cross. And as a consequence of Christ's atoning work, and he concluded, both the healing of the body and the peace of the soul are accorded to us. We are totally forgiven from sin 
and set free from all illness. I think Nee misinterprets this passage. Yes, Jesus' death on the cross guarantees the healing and restoration of all creation. And someday, all things will be brought under his feet. And he will wipe away all tears. He will do away with all sickness and illness. But in the meantime, we live in a fallen world. Many faith healers base their ministry on a similar understanding of God's will for us and the extent of Christ's work. Some go so far as to assert that the prayer that is offered in genuine faith will always result in healing. This implies, of course, that people who do not experience healing lack sufficient faith, or maybe there is some unconfessed sin in their life. How much faith is sufficient faith? Didn't Jesus say you only need faith the size of a mustard seed? That's pretty small. This simply does not match up with what we see in the stories of the Gospels. Jesus healed people regardless of the amount of faith they had. Jairus' daughter, the man in the synagogue with the withered hand, the Gadarene demoniac, the widow's son in the village of Cana, Jesus healed them, not because of their faith, but out of compassion. The only incident I can recall where Jesus was unable to perform many miracles because of a lack of faith um, was on the, on the part of the people, was in his hometown of Nazareth. But the text seems to be telling us that the reason Jesus performed few healings there was because People did not bring the sick to him. It wasn't because of the lack of faith on the part of the afflicted ones. But those who were, who were well did not bring the sick to, to Jesus because they did not believe that the carpenter's son who had grown up on the street next to them could heal them. Likewise, sin was never an obstacle to prevent Jesus from healing people. He didn't quiz people about their lifestyle or their behaviors before considering helping them. There were a couple of occasions when, after healing people, he told them to stop sinning. But their sin never acted as a barrier to prevent them from experiencing the loving touch of Jesus. If we do some biblical reflection, we will discover that healing was withheld from people of faith and integrity in a number of instances. Paul's thorn in the flesh comes to mind immediately in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says three times he begged God to give him relief, to take this away, that it might leave him. And God did not respond to that prayer, but simply said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. In Galatians chapter 4, Paul talks about an illness that affected his ministry among them. Presumably, it was a, a problem with eyesight because he says, I know that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Commentators speculate that maybe his thorn in the flesh was recurring migraine headaches or depression or a debilitating back pain. We don't know for sure. We know that Timothy suffered from chronic stomach problems and frequent illnesses. 1 Timothy 5, 23. Epaphroditus had an illness that nearly led to his death. Philippians 2, 27. Trophimus, Paul's traveling companion on his third missionary journey, got left behind. Paul had to leave him behind in, Trophy, in Miletus because he was too sick to travel. Stephen and James were martyred, and many of the apostles as well. All of these were highly esteemed, gifted, and dedicated leaders. Explanations such as personal sin, Defect, faith, demonic activity are hardly helpful in these cases. Paul was a person 
who had much success in praying for the sick. But in these instances, there was no immediate healing. Here is the great mystery. Some people are healed and some are not. We can pray, we can seek, we can knock, we can persist in all manner of faith, but ultimately it rests in God's hands. Sometimes he heals and sometimes he does not. I'm not sharing these things to discourage you from seeking healing or from praying for the healing up for others. I believe that God still heals the sick today. I have seen some amazing answers to prayer. But every experience we have of divine healing is just a temporary blessing, a postponement of suffering and our ultimate death. All the people Jesus healed eventually got sick and died again and died. Even his good friend Lazarus, who was raised from the dead after being buried for four days, got sick and had to die all over again. We live in a fallen world and God's kingdom has not come in its fullness. Once in a while, we catch a little glimpse, a little experience, a foretaste of that kingdom when God touches and heals and restores in miraculous ways. But we live in this world where the kingdom has not come in its fullness. We still look forward to that day when we shall have access to that tree of healing of the nations in Revelation. Sometimes we see sickness defeated, pain soothed, and broken hearts mended, but we continue to live in a world of coronaviruses, of deadly typhoons, of opioid addictions, cancers, and dementia. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. When trouble comes, sickness and hardship or suffering, there is comfort in knowing that we are not alone. Jesus himself, who experienced all the pain and trials, the loneliness and grief, hunger and thirst, rejection, affliction and death, has overcome the world and offers us his holy companionship in the midst of our trials. He is with us and will carry us through our journey of pain. When we, when we walk through the valley of the, the dark valley of the shadow of death, we do not fear evil because our shepherd walks with us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Oh my goodness, what a blessing. And God bless the heart of Dr. Eva. Um, precious one, this is this is the man I've been talking about. He he's he's a gem. Um he's a well full of the grace of God. Full of the grace of God. Um he doesn't only lecture and teach us, he encourages us. He prays with us and prays for us. I have seen him many of many times shed tears right in the lecture theater as we we pray, as we pray for um, we pray for a student who probably couldn't make it, maybe because he or she is sick or might be going through something, and I've I've seen him cry whilst we pray together. Uh, for such a person. Um, Dr. Eva um, lives in Edmonton and teaches courses in inter 
cultural studies and spiritual formation at Taylor Seminary. He grew up in Brazil where his parents were missionaries. He has pastored churches in Canada and the USA and served for eight years in Nigeria where he taught at Mambila Baptist Theological Seminary and did outreach to an enraged Muslim group. Since earning his PhD in intercultural studies, he has taught in Cameroon, the Philippines, Russia, and as an adjunct faculty member at Kerry Theological College in Vancouver. He has published numerous artic articles in missiological journals. He has been married to Karen for 34 years, and they have two daughters one born in Nigeria and the other in Los Angeles. Great man of God. He was born to missionary parents, has been on missions many times himself, um, has pastored uh, churches, and then he's teaching pastors, raising pastors. Now, I want to say thank you to the pastors the men and women of God that are watching today. You know, these sessions are sessions that are supposed to equip us to put tools into our hands so that we can go back, go back into our churches and teach our members also. Uh, not just for us to receive, but also to go and impact it to our congregation members whilst we equip ourselves as individuals as well. Uh, he's going to be on the rest of the, hopefully Tuesdays are going to be dedicated to him. And then I and Bishop Maxwell will be sharing the other, uh, the, the Saturdays with other speakers that will come on board later among other issues. You remember I was teaching on the, the subordinate relationship with a superior, how to become an owner. I'll definitely come back on Saturday and, and finish it up. And then Bishop Maxwell will come and then I may come again or another a resource person may come. But hey, look, look, look at what we just heard. For me, my take, what all that I heard was that whatever we will receive on earth here is temporal. Whatever we will receive here is temporal. If you receive a miracle of healing, you will die anyway. But the question is, in case you die, where is your final destination? I believe in miracles. I love miracles. I love signs and wonders. I love the demonstration of God's, God's power. But along the line, I lost my firstborn son and the pain is still in my heart. It is the reason why my take is here. So that somebody out there will, uh, somebody needs to know that it's not all about the jumping and the anointing and the, the, the demonstration of power. There is a reality of life that will confront everybody one day. One day. And Pastor Eastwood Anaba will tell you that every star has a scar. Don't forget. Pastor, if you're having challenges with your church, don't forget it's part of life. It's part of life. Back in Africa, mostly we say, well, this person is sick and that thing has happened to the person because he or she might have sinned or somebody might have cursed him here or there. No, it is part of life. And we thank God for Jesus who agreed to go to the cross for us. Because the ultimate thing for me is to make heaven. And he went to the cross and shed his blood so that I will have the opportunity to share in, in, in the glorious home of God, heaven. The ultimate thing. Man of God, I don't know, I don't know your take. Um, but uh, thank, thank you guys again, men of God and women of God and those, all of you that are watching today's broadcast. Uh, my heart is so heavy 
but I thank God for Dr. Afa for allowing and availing himself to be used and to speak to us this afternoon. Man of, man, man of God, your take. I want to say to the professor that God bless him so much. Mm. That was a powerful word. Mm. And what I really learned is that take heart mm. when Jesus told the mm. disciples. Take heart. Because as for the pain mm. and the challenges, mm. it's a mystery. It's a mystery. And sometimes it's like the mountains surrounding Jerusalem, mm. they are unmovable mm. and they are unshakable. Mm. You pray and sometimes nothing yes, happens. Yeah, yeah. But Jesus is saying that take heart. Take heart. Yes, overcome. Take heart. Mm. Because we need the peace of God. We need it. So we are praying that. Mm. I don't know who also is going through that situation. Mm. But Jesus is saying that take heart. Take heart. And we need the peace of God. Of God. We need a peace of because God. Because as human as we are, mm. definitely we will go through that. Mm. But as we go through, mm. we ask for the peace mm. and we ask for the grace. The grace. So whatever that you are going through, may the Lord give you that peace. Peace. And that grace. Grace. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name. I want to say thank you to Bishop Benjamin Bosman. Uh, you, you're watching with us. Um, God bless your heart. Uh, my brother Isaac Berquin, God bless you so much. Uh, hey, my own protocol man, Mr. Agble, God bless you so much. Such a wonderful man. God bless your heart. Having you were with us. I don't know whether you are still there. Uh, uh, Kobe, God bless you. Having you are watching all the way from Hanover in Germany and then uh, Prophet Gideon Pipra, God bless your heart so much. Apostle Barnabas, you, you always watch from Pretoria in South Africa. God bless your heart. Uh, Sister Faustina Kasi, Asibete, God bless you. There are others until you let me know where you are watching from. I will not be able to tell, but there are others that are watching us and want to say God bless you. Hey. My, my brother, William Komla Amenyo, you are watching from Georgia, Atlanta in the USA. God bless your heart so much. Say hi to uh, Pastor Emmanuel Owusu for us. Another wonderful man of God. I call him the pastor of pastors. But you know what? Uh, Saturday, I am coming back with a subordinate attitude. How to be able to serve your boss whether you are an associate pastor, whether you are a subordinate in the corporate office, whether you are a wife, you are supposed to submit, you are a son, a daughter, you are supposed to submit, I will come your way on Saturday. But don't forget, anytime it is the turn of Dr. Eva, he will come and I want you to get your pen and paper or notebook ready because he will be tutoring us. He'll be teaching us. These are the things we go to the classroom to learn. Because you see, amongst charismatics and Pentecostals, man of God, like I told you yesterday, we, 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 don't, we don't understand the, the issue of um, the fact that pain and suffering is part of life. And whether God is speaking or not, of course, there is this pray, thing called prayer of faith. He, instead of sometimes preparing somebody who is nearing death, preparing the person to be able to make heaven, we bind and lose things are not bindable and not losable. Yeah. I haven't lost my faith yet. I'm so Reverend Frimpo. I believe in miracles yeah. still. But there is a time that there will be the need to prepare that person to make heaven which is the ultimate. That is, if God responds to our prayer or not, the right. ultimate thing is heaven. You know, so we need this balance. I am a Pentecostal uh, pastor, but I attended a Baptist seminary college. And so I have this balanced theology and doctrine. And you need it, man of God. You need to teach your people how to believe in miracles. But you need to also teach them how to understand the total counsel of God. 
Don't put yourself under pressure, unnecessary pressure. Because somebody is going to leave your church after praying many years and nothing is changing. But if the person has this understanding, when God is not answering, it doesn't change God. God will still be God. And that person will continue to serve him. Now we bless God for Dr. Efe's life. And thank you so much, man of God, thank you, for, for, for making it. Hey, Apostle James Kuda, uh, God bless you, prophet of God. And then my only landlord in the United Kingdom, uh, Mr. Patrick Ajay. God bless you so much. Adieu, uh, Theophilus. Um, God bless you also. I don't know where you are watching from, but we, we thank God for your lives because until you watch, there's no broadcast. We hope to see you on Saturday. But um, until we meet again, as I always say, be wise. Wear a mask because you need to stay alive. If you would die, not COVID-19, out of foolishness. Be wise, wear a mask, keep your distance. Because you, see, you know what? We pray that, we pray for you that God will keep you safe. But we need you to be wise. I want to see you on Saturday. And I pray that as you go wising up, wearing your mask, and keeping your distance, God will preserve you. I will see you again. Man of God. Can you share a short word of prayer? It's alarming what is happening in the United States. We all we have our challenge here in Canada and other places, but it's alarming. 21 people dying in a day. Yesterday is 184,000 people getting infected in a day. I mean, this is disheartening. This is heartbreaking. And, and for me, I don't know about you, but many time I watch this on CNN, it, it breaks my heart. Can we share a word of prayer that this vaccine they are working on will, will come and come quickly and, and, and that people will wash up. There are others that are demonstrating against wearing of masks and saying having all kinds of, uh, of, of understanding about COVID. But whether we believe it or not, COVID is real. Yeah. People have died. People yes. are dying. But God have mercy on us and preserve us. Man of God, pray with us. Father, we want to thank you. Want thank to you, Lord. You bless. Such a wonderful time. Mm. We thank you. Even your voice says that in every situation, mm. we have to give you thanks. We need to give you thanks. Concerning our lives. Jesus. We thank you that we are alive. We bless. We give you all the glory. We give you all the glory, Lord. Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We know COVID has brought pain to pain. humanity. Yes. It has brought pain to humanity. Mm. So Father, we pray that, oh God, you will intervene. Intervene, Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name Christ. of Jesus. Father, you created the world. Yes. The world belongs to you. Jesus. Humanity belongs to you. Yes. Whether unbeliever or believer, mm. they all belong to you. To you. Jesus. So, Father, we pray that, oh God, you will intervene. Intervene, and Lord. As Father, the, the hey. scientists are working on the pa, vaccine. Pa, 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 pa. We pray for knowledge. knowledge we pray Lord. for wisdom. Wisdom. So that they will be able to come up with a vaccine mm. that will take care of this COVID. Hey. In the ka, ba, ba. name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And we are also coming against every blast of the enemy. Mm. Father, with this COVID, mm. we know always the enemy uses advantage mm. when situation ba, 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 ba. rises. Yes. But Lord, the Bible says that we are not ignorant we are of not any ignorant, devices Lord. We are not of ignorant. the enemy. Yes. So we take full control we over take control, every plans of the ta, enemy ta, ta, ta. in the area of this COVID. Mm. In the name of in the Jesus. Name of Jesus. Jesus. Jehovah God. Mm. May you move once move, again. Move. Cause the wind of revival, a mm. wind of restoration, mm. a wind of healing to blow over humanity. Mm. In the name, in of, the Jesus name of Jesus. Christ, Jesus. Spirit of the living God, mm. have your own way. Have your own way, Lord. Have your own way, oh God. Have your own way. And let your will be done. Thank you, Lord. We pray for peace. Thank you, Lord. We pray for peace. We pray for peace. We pray for peace. Mm. We pray for stability. Thank you, Lord. In the name in of, the Jesus, name of Jesus. Jesus. We thank you. Thank Thank you, oh Lord. Lord. Thank you. We bless you, oh we bless, Lord. Lord. May you continue, continue to Lord. preserve a 
every to soul. preserve every preserve soul, Lord. Us, Jesus. Lord God, and protect us. Protect and us. And order our steps. Mm. In Jesus' in name. In Jesus' mighty name. We have prayed. Mm. Amen. Amen and amen. God amen. bless you, man of God. Amen. That is Pastor King George Obin. But hey, I see amen. Matty. Matty Coppin, you, you're watching. Uh, that's my mate at Taylor Seminary. I don't know where... You're watching us from whether you are back to Australia or you are still in Canada, but God bless you so much. Uh, Alfred, you are watching from Leeds in the United Kingdom. God bless your heart. Man of God, Kobe, God bless you. And then my friend and my brother, uh, Mr. Frank Edu, an elder of the Pentecost Church and a, a staff of Regent University uh, College in Accra, Ghana. Hey, Reverend Abel Banafu, Thank you so much for making it. Um, this, this, the Tuesday sessions are actually going to be a sessions pastors because uh, Dr. Efa has, as I told you, he's been a pastor, a pastor's child. He, he's been a pastor. He's teaching pastors how to do ministry. And so this, the Tuesday specifically will be our sessions. But I want to thank you all for making this broadcast a blessed one. God bless you. But let's enjoy this uh, music from our own brother back in Accra, Reverend Kojo Otin with the International Central Gospel Church. God bless you. We'll see you again on Saturday. Thy word, our way. Of thy protection, I was strength, thy grace, I will rule, thy word, I will I dare not trust the seed of spirit, but I hold it on Jesus' name. Come on, everybody. On Christ the Lord, live on my sin. All on the ground is sinking. All on the ground. Jesus' blood and 
right to fear. I dare not trust the seed of spirit, but I hold it on to the slave. Come on, everybody. Oh, Christ, the soul, live on my sin. All I have brought is in his All I have brought is in his sin. Oh, Christ, the soul, rock my
Our way. 